you have a Bible, turn to Numbers chapter 11. Um, if you're newer to the Bible, that's right near the front. And uh, it's a bit of an odd place to start, and I'll explain it in a second, but, but this week is the last week of our Holy Spirit series, and we're going to talk today about prophecy, or the prophetic. Um, and, and it's going to be a really fun, uh, fun morning, just as the last few weeks have been super fun. Um, but I want to start in Numbers 11 for a very specific reason, okay? Uh, in, in the book of Numbers, if you remember, Moses, right, was the one that God called to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt and to the promised land. Mom, Moses doesn't end up making it to the promised land for various reasons. But in this book, particularly in Numbers, Moses is just having a hard time. Like, I just imagine Moses feeling like a kindergarten teacher, you know, when the class just gets out of control. Like, when the, the, the teacher is no longer in charge of the room, you know. Uh, some people have been there in kids' church or whatever. Like, you have lost control. And Moses has lost control of the Israelites in this passage. He just, he doesn't have any more grip on them. They're rebellious and obstinate. They just will not pay attention to what Moses is saying. So Moses approaches God right before this chapter. He says, God, I just can't do this on my own. I know you've called me to lead these people, but it's too much. The burden is too large. So the Lord says, all right, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take 70 men, 70 leaders from the people, and I'm going to take some of the authority, some of the spirit, some of the power that you have, and I'm going to put it on them so that they can help share the burden of leadership with you. Okay, so that's where we pick up here. We're going to start in verse 24. Here's what it says, Numbers 11, 24. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. The tent is the tabernacle, not just any tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him. And he took some of the power of the spirit that was on Moses and he put it on the 70 elders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. They prophesied, but did not do so again. So just as we begin this topic, from Genesis to Revelation, from all of human history, God has always been a God who speaks. I love what A.W. Tozer said. He, he, he says, speaking is not just something God does, it's who he is. It is in the nature of God to speak, to reveal himself, to disclose himself. He has never been a God who has hidden himself or shrouded himself. He has always revealed himself. He speaks in so many different forms in so many different ways. He is a God who speaks. But in the Old Testament, what we see is only certain individuals, particularly those who are leading the people of Israel, only specific leaders and people were able to hear from God. And, and we've called them prophets or we call them leaders. In the book of Judges, they're called judges, right? These are the elite few in the Old Testament who could hear from God. And so all of the people, right, are dependent upon those few people to hear from God. You remember the people of Israel on Mount Sinai. They, they begin to see what God's doing and they just nudge Moses and they're like, why don't you go up in here? You, you just tell us what God says. <laughs> this is too freaky. We don't want to go up there ourselves. You go, you give us a word, right? So, so, so let's, that's what happening, uh, what's happening with these elders. The spirit comes on them and they prophesy. Verse 26, however, two men, now remember there were 70 at the tent, right? And now there's two here. I don't have time to get into this, but Jesus in Luke chapter 10 sends out 72. And it's a reference back to this passage. That's just a fun fact. Two men whose names were Eldad and Medad had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but they did not go out to the tent. Yet the spirit also rested on them and they prophesied in the camp. In other words, they're hearing from God and they're prophesying in the middle of the camp where everybody is. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. First of all, a bunch of people name their kids Bible names, but I have never heard twins named Eldad and Medad. So I, that would be a first for me. It's like people just take a couple Bible names. There's lots, of, uh, there's lots of good ones. Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and says, Moses, my Lord, stop them. Too much prophesying going on. Stop them. But Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? Listen to this. I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moses and the elders returned to the camp. So remember where we're at in the Old Testament, only the man of God is supposed to hear from God. And all of a sudden, Eldad and Medad are running around prophesying all over the camp and, and Joshua sees this as a threat. 
Joshua wants to stop them. Why? Because again, the man of God, the voice of God was restricted to only a handful of people. And, and, and yet Moses makes this incredible statement. He goes, no, no, I wish, wouldn't it be amazing? Wouldn't it be incredible if the spirit came to rest on all of God's people and they could all hear from God? And then for thousands of years, Moses' words just kind of fade into the mists of history until one specific moment. But, 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 but let me back up and just say, a lot of people are still living in this passage. Wouldn't it be great if I could hear God? Ah, I'm just gonna have to wait for the pastor to get up and give me a word. I'm just gonna have to depend on somebody else's faith. I'm just gonna have to depend on somebody else's relationship. I'm just gonna have to live in that place. Somebody go up the mountain and hear from God for me. And yet Moses makes this amazing statement and for thousands of years, it just fades into history until one day. We read the beginning of it last week, but listen to this. Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost when the church is born and he quotes from Joel 2 and look at what he says. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on who? On all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Did you know that you and I are the fulfillment of the dream that Mo Moses had all those years ago? Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be amazing? Wouldn't it be such a dream if all God's people could prophesy? And here Peter stands up and says, hey, in the last days, God's gonna put his spirit on all of his people and they will all be able to prophesy. It's no longer limited to the elite few, but we get it so backwards, right? I hear so many people, man, I wish I could have faith like Moses. I wish I could have a relationship with God like David or like Noah. And these were incredible men of God. I don't wanna denigrate that at all. But I think if we stood in front of Moses today, right? We'd look at him and we'd be like, Moses, what was it like to part the Red Sea? And Moses would just laugh. He would be like, what was it like to have God living inside of you? Yeah. You don't understand. Yeah, Moses parted the Red Sea, but God would have to come down in a cloud and speak, and then God would leave, and there would be nothing, and they would be dependent on the last thing. There was no relationship. There was no intimacy. And instead of parting the Red Sea, as amazing as those things are, you have to realize the Spirit of God lives in you, and you are the fulfillment of the dream that Moses had. Every person in this room can prophesy. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna prove that to you this morning, but I wanna take us back in time to a verse we've read a couple times before. 1 Corinthians 14, 1. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit. And now we get to the end, especially prophecy. Paul singles out this one gift. Why, why is that? Why does Paul say, hey, I want you to desire all the gifts, including tongues. We spoke about that last week. You can go watch the video. But I want you to desire all of them, but especially this one. I'm gonna get into why that is. But I, I'm, I'm, I don't have time, like I said last week, to, to go, I could teach for prof, on prophecy for six weeks, no problem. It's an amazing, it's so deep. There's so much about it in the Bible, but I'm gonna give you a you know, 30,000 feet overview, okay? So here's just a few things. The first thing you need to know about prophecy is that prophecy is easy. Pro right, we, every time I say the word prophecy, there's a bell that goes off. No, no, that's not for me, right? We think of this like big guy in a white beard who's like, thus saith the Lord, or somebody predicting the future or apocalyptic, you know, language in the book of Revelation and the end times. And, and there are elements of that in some places uh, in the New Testament, but the primary expression of prophecy is not any of that. It's so easy, right? It's so easy. A and I'm sorry because I, I know that in the church, some people have had a vested interest in making this complicated. If I wanna build my brand, if I wanna build my ministry, if I just wanna build myself and my gifting up, I will say, no, no, prophecy is difficult. You gotta come to me, I'll hear God for you. You need to be dependent on me. You need to, I need you to need me. And some people make other people, they want this to be complicated. They want you to think it's hard to hear God. They want you to think it's difficult to hear God's voice, to deliver prophetic words to people, but it's not. It's so easy. Let me show you how easy it is. John 10, 27. Jesus says this. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Jesus promises if you are one of his sheep, if you believe him, you can hear his voice. He does not say, 
there's an elite spec ops commando unit of sheep who can hear the voice of God. The elite few, right? They can hear God. No, he says, if you are one of his sheep, you can hear God's voice so you can prophesy. Yeah, and, and listen, again, we have this idea, oh, prophecy. So I'm gonna give you a simple definition, all right? This is the most basic definition of prophecy in the New Testament, okay? There's a difference between prophecy in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I can't get into the depths of that today. Uh, but here's what prophecy is for us today. Prophecy is hearing from God and communicating his heart to others using human language. Prophecy is hearing from God and communicating his heart to others using human language. So prophecy is not just about predicting the future. Now, there are elements of that. In Acts chapter 10, there's a prophet named Agabus, and he tells things that, that, will to, uh, that are to come. There, there are some people that God has gifted in that way, right? But that's not all it's about. At the most basic level, it's a word of encouragement given by the Spirit through a believer to another person, okay? It's, it's that easy. We can all prophesy. Now, does that mean we're all prophets? The last thing we need is a bunch of people strutting around saying, hey, Pastor David told me I'm a prophet today. <laughs> Next thing I know, I'm going on Facebook and it's like, it's no longer John Griffin, it's Prophet John Griffin. You know, he just stuck it in front of his name. It's like, <laughs> it's not just a title we throw around, right? There is a specific ministry, some people call it an office, in the New Testament of people who are uniquely called to be a prophet, right? What does Paul say in Ephesians 4? Christ himself gave apostles prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So are there unique people who are called to be prophets? Yes. Are there people who are uniquely gifted? They have a special grace. They can hear things at an accurate high level. Yes, yes. But that does not mean that every person in this room can't prophesy, okay? So there's a difference between that, right? So we are not all prophets. But here's the other thing. Even those who are prophets, the idea of people who call themselves a prophet strutting around, building their own name, building their own ego, building their own ministry. Hey, look at how great I am. I'm a prophet. God's called me to be a prophet. Put me up there. Give me a microphone. That has nothing to do with what Paul says here. He says, if you're a prophet, you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to build people. Yeah. You're not supposed to promote yourself. You're supposed to build people. Prophecy is about people. God is interested in building people. And again, that's the reason why we talked about tongues last week. Paul says, hey, that's not the primary thing you need to do when you get together because it builds you. But prophecy is the opposite. It builds people. Good. So it's easy. If you're his sheep, you can hear his voice. Prophecy is easy. You hear his voice, you communicate to other people. Here's the second thing. Prophecy is encouraging. Prophecy is encouraging. 1 Corinthians 14, starting in verse two. Paul says, anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies, who are they speaking to? To people. Tongue speaking to God, prophecy is speaking to people for what? They're strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. The purpose of prophecy in the New Testament is strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. I'll give you a catchy little way you can think about it. Prophecy is to build up, to stir up, and to cheer up. Build up, stir up, cheer up. So what does that mean? If the word that someone is saying or hearing, and they're saying this is from God, if it doesn't build up, stir up, and cheer up, it's not what we're supposed to be doing with prophecy. There's, there's a whole list of words that Paul could have used that he did not use in this pas passage. He, he did not say prophecy is for judgment, condemnation, manipulation, shame, gossip, guilt, and condescension. Praise God. None of those words are in there. But for some reason, those have worked their way in when people have talked about prophecy. Judgment, manipulation, God's angry with you, God's mad at you, God's gonna judge you, God's pointing out your sin, God doesn't like you, you know, all of these kinds of things. Nowhere in there, build up, stir up, cheer up. But there are horrible stories, and I recognize this morning, there are horrible stories of people who had someone say, I'm speaking on behalf of God. Here's what, God tell, here's what God's telling you right now. God says there's hidden sin in your life, and if you don't repent, God will take your family and your ministry and your career away from you. So here's what God says. If you don't give money to my ministry, God will take the blessing off your life. Here's what God says. God will send sickness on you if you don't do blank. 
Here's what God says. God is judging you for your sin that you committed 10 years ago and you don't even know what sin it is, but it's there. And people rack their brains. I've seen people go crazy, destroying themselves, trying to, I can't figure out what I'm doing wrong. The prophet said that, that, and I just feel so condemned. I feel so ashamed. I feel so guilty. Is that build up, stir up, or cheer up? No, then that's not the point of prophecy. My wife, Madison, talks about, uh, she has this term. She calls it getting slimed. <laughs> getting slimed is when someone comes up to pray for you or to give you a word and you leave feeling worse than you did before. Like, wait, were you praying for me? Because I feel like a negative withdrawal has taken place in my spiritual bank account. I feel worse, right? Somebody just comes up, they're just like, God, I just pray for David. I just pray that he wouldn't have to try so hard, that he wouldn't feel like he has to show off for everyone, that he wouldn't have to, no, let's, I've had this happen, that he would just feel, realize that pride is not the answer, and that God, that you would just humble him, amen. And you just like, you just, ah, I need to take a shower. Like you just feel like you got slimed. That's not what prophecy is supposed to feel like. You're not supposed to leave feeling slimy. And listen, some people have just slimed me one too many times. They come up, I got a word from God for you. No, thanks. <laughs> and listen, by the power vested in me by having this microphone, I just bestow upon you the gift of telling certain people, no, thanks. <laughs> listen, if you know that this person, when they speak over you, when they speak words over you, you feel slimy and guilty and condemned and gross, you do not have to receive every word that people speak over you. You can say, no, thank you. <laughs> Prophecy is supposed to be encouraging. Look at Proverbs 12, 25. Anxiety in a person's heart weighs him down, but an encouraging word brings him joy. One of the solutions, hear me carefully, one of many of the solutions that I believe God has given the body of Christ to combat this epidemic of anxiety that we're facing, both within the church and without, is to hear encouraging words from the Holy Spirit and give those words to people. Anxiety weighs people down, but an encouraging word. Listen, we believe in counseling. We believe in medication if that's necessary. What I'm not saying is, you know, if you have anxiety or you have depression, all you need is one encouraging word and everything will go away, okay? It doesn't always work like that. But it's one beautiful way. I've seen this work. I've tested it. It has passed the experimental test in my own life of talking to people. And I have the most basic word. Like sometimes I'm like, God, give me something better. <laughs> like give me the, their mother's maiden name or something. Like give me something impressive. Give me revelation. Tell me what's gonna happen for the next six months of their life in detail. And God's like, nope, here's what I'm giving you. God says he loves you and he knows your name and, and blah, blah, blah. It's the most simple thing. And I don't even wanna give it, but fine. I go up and I do it. I say, hey, this might sound crazy. God just told me he loves you. He knows your name. Oh my God, you have no idea how bad I needed to hear that. You've changed my life. And I'm like, what? One encouraging word has more power to break things off of people than a million words that you and I could invent. If it's the right moment and it's the right word from God, it can break strongholds of anxiety. It can break strongholds of depression. It can break strongholds of unbelief over people's life. It's a supernatural ability, ability excuse me, to encourage. The Bible says life and death are where? In the power of the tongue. So what happens if we yield our tongue to the spirit and we allow him to bring life to people around us? That's what prophecy is. That's what prophecy is. So prophecy is easy. Prophecy is encouraging. Here's the third thing. Prophecy should be tested. Prophecy should be tested. First Thessalonians chapter five, starting in verse 19. Paul says, do not quench the spirit. That's another message. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. Notice it doesn't say test some of them. When you receive a prophecy, it doesn't say test some of them. It says test them all. If anyone ever claims to be giving a word from God for you, and they say, you, do not need, you don't need to test this. This is coming from a man of God. Some people will even say, if you test this, that means you're doubting God. No, sir. <laughs> no, sir. If you test their prophetic word, it's because you wanna be faithful to the Bible. Test every single word. 
always, 100% of the time. Every time I receive a word from someone, I say, hey, I feel like God's giving me this word. I ask this question. I say, God, is all of this from you? Is some of it from you? Or is none of it from you? It could be either, it's not just one or the other. It could be either. Sometimes we get a word from God, but we insert a little bit of our own feelings. We insert a little bit of our own beliefs, our own whatever, you know, we ate for breakfast that morning, like whatever the case may be. We, we kind of, there can be a little bit of a mixture and the Holy Spirit will help you pull that out. What do you do? You hold on to what is good. You reject what's not good, right? But some people, that process is too hard. And so they just cut it off from, from the root. They just say, it's a sham. I don't have time for prophecy. It's just, it's not real. It's all fake. And so Paul has something to say to them, right? What does he say? Do not treat prophecies with contempt. You do not have the option of just saying, that's all a sham. Somebody gave me a bad one, word one time. Somebody gave me a word that was just them speaking. Somebody gave me a word that was false. Somebody gave me a word that was, you know, that wounded me. I'm telling you, one thing I've discovered with this is some people would rather live wounded than face the pain of healing. And somebody gave them a word 20 years ago and it so wounded them that they now do what Paul commanded them not to do. They just treat it all with contempt. They're too good for it. They're too smart for it. They're too highbrow for it. Whatever the case may be, they treat it with contempt. But here's the deal. If I, if I find a counterfeit $20 bill in my wallet, I don't go burn all my money. <laughs> the one counterfeit bill does not make me want to go to the ATM. It's like, I wish I had $3,000 because now I burned it all. Because I found one bill that was fake, right? Listen, the enemy only counterfeits things that are valuable. The enemy only counterfeits things that are valuable. Like imagine if I, if I pulled up with a suitcase and I opened it up and it was full of $3 bills. Like I found some counterfeit bills. You don't counterfeit $3 bills. Why? Because there are no $3 bills. You know, some people are obsessed with false prophets. There's a lot of false prophets out there. For there to be false prophets, there has to be real prophets. For there to be false prophecy, there has to be real prophecy. The enemy only counterfeits something that's real. And the reason why the enemy has tried so hard is because he realizes the power that this could have. If every believer in this room was unleashed out of these doors, hearing from God, hearing words from God, just like Moses said, oh, I wish this would happen. If we would all walk and we would come to that place of hearing and communicating to each other, I, I just long to see a day when that lobby out there is full of people who are just giving each other words, encouraging words. There's tears, there's laughing, there's... Whatever the case may be, that's the kind of environment that God has called us to live in. Every believer operating in that gift, encouraging each other, but we have to test every word. So how do I test prophetic words? I'm glad you asked. Here's the first test. The first test for any prophetic word is the scriptural test. Is it biblical? Now, does that mean, is it in the Bible? No. The definition of a prophetic word is it something not in the Bible. But listen to me very closely. Prophetic words are not in any way equal to the Bible. Like, it's not even close, okay? There ain't nobody in here who's like adding to the end of book of Revelation. Like, listen, I wrote a new chapter of the Bible last night. You want to proofread? Like, no. <laughs> that ain't happening, all right? That's done. But we, we do get these words that are outside of the Bible, but they never, listen, never will contradict God's word. They will never contradict the written word of God. And if they do, you throw them straight out. There's nothing, that, there's no need to like, well, that, nope. If it, if it contradicts scripture, it's gone. So if somebody says to me, you know, comes up to me and says, hey, I feel like I have a word from God for you. I just feel like you have a business partner. She hasn't treated you well. And I just feel like you're supposed to just take a little bit of extra from the business account this month. You know, just because the Lord says they've just been a real jerk. And so, like, no, they're encouraging you to steal from someone. That's not, that's anti-biblical. You just throw that straight out. And that might be a little bit too overblown, but there are lots of subtle and crafty ways that the enemy likes to twist this to get us to come against this. This, this, this is the ultimate and final authority. Always, in every situation. I'll give you another example. If I go over to a local Parker County or Tarrant County courthouse and I'm in some kind of uh, legal judicial proceeding and the verdict goes against me, okay, I get ruled against by the judge. I don't freak out and lose my mind and say the world's over. Why? Because in our system, I can appeal to a higher court. 
We know how this works, right? If you lose in a low court, you say, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not gonna receive that. I'm going to the higher court. And then the higher court rules against you. You go, no, I'm going to the higher court. Whatever the case may be, until you go up and up and up until you get where? Until you get to the Supreme Court, right? This is the Supreme Court. Every prophetic word that you get from someone is like a lower municipal court, okay? It's just a word someone says, but you always appeal until you get to the Supreme Court. What happens when the Supreme Court rules? It's final. There's no more appeal. There's nothing. It's done. And so if you take that word that you received to the Supreme Court, to this authority, and it doesn't line up and it contradicts, it's gone. There's no appeal. It's done. That's the scriptural test, okay? Here's the second test, the encouragement test. The encouragement test. Now, I already talked about this, right? Prophecy is encouraging. So if someone claims to be giving you a word and you feel condemned and guilty and ashamed, right? There's a great chance that word is not from God. Why? Romans 8, 1 says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if someone's bringing condemnation on you, it doesn't sound like that's from Jesus, right? And just as, as as a brief aside, will you sometimes feel conviction from the Spirit? Of course. But let me tell you how you can tell the difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction says, I made a mistake. Condemnation says, I am a mistake. If you leave feeling, I just feel like I'm a mistake. I don't even know why God put me here. I don't even know why God made me. I don't even know what I'm doing here. That's condemnation. That's not from God. Conviction says, you know what? I think I did something that doesn't line up. You know what? I have hope and God can restore me, and God can move me forward, okay? So there might be conviction that comes sometimes through a word, but never condemnation, never guilt. If you do not feel encouraged, listen, some of the times I've felt most encouraged have been when I'm, I've been slapped in the face, right? But it was a good slap, you know? It's a slap from a friend, right? Faithful are the wounds of the friend, the Bible says. The encouragement test, is it encouraging? Here's the third test, the character test. The character test. What I find really interesting is when Jesus talks about false prophets in Matthew chapter seven. You can go read it. I don't have time to read the whole passage. When Jesus talks about false prophets in Matthew seven, it seems in my mind like he, he would have ended up saying, here's how you know false prophets. You will know them by their words. But Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus says you will know them by their fruit. In other words, one of the ways you can test and see if someone who's giving this word, if they're coming from a good place, if the word is coming from a good place, is to actually evaluate their character, evaluate their track record, evaluate the fruit that is coming off their tree. How do they treat people around them? Do they walk in love? Do they walk in the fruit of the spirit? Have they lived it? Like if someone is living a life that is totally unbiblical, their character is not in line, you have a good reason to just back up and be like, "Mm, I don't think I'm gonna receive from you. I'm testing, I've tested your character and it's, it, ain't, it ain't good, right? Like, I do not want to eat rotten apples. It just doesn't taste good, right? And I grew up in a church that was all into things of prophecy and the prophetic and it was amazing. It, it was many times done in a healthy way. But as a result of that, I, I have seen countless, I'm talking hundreds of people who have claimed I'm a prophet or I'm a prophetic person or I have a ministry of prophecy or whatever the case may be. Do you know the ones that I would never recommend to Pastor Joey or to the elders to come to this church? The, one who, the, the ones who got off stage and treated the volunteers like garbage. The ones who went in the green room and treated their assistant like trash. I don't care how gifted or talented you think you are. Paul says, I could know all the mysteries in the universe. And if I do not have love, it's worthless. The test, the ultimate test of whether or not someone is speaking from God is the fruit of their life. Do they walk in love? Are they overflowing with grace and mercy? How do they treat people they consider to be beneath them? If you see all of those red flags, you can immediately say, you know what? I don't think the fruit's good. And I don't want to eat rotten fruit. The motive is always more important than the message. The motive is always more important than the message. There are a lot of people who can preach well. There are a lot of people who can even prophesy well. There's a lot of people who have lots of gifts. But the ultimate test is the motivation. What's in the heart level? Felker, if you could uh, come give me some help on keys. As I was praying for how to end this message and where I felt like the Lord was 
was heading, this phrase just kept coming up in me as I was praying. Um, why are we talking about prophecy? What's the point? What's the ultimate takeaway? Why do we need to pursue this? Why do we need to walk in this? It's this. One word from God can change everything. One word from God can change everything. Look at Psalm 29. Amazing passage. I wish I could read it all, but look at verse nine. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forests bare. This whole chapter, Psalm 29, is about the voice of God. And here the psalmist is saying, the voice of God, a word from God, anything coming out of his mouth, it's so powerful that the imagery that's given is that it literally strips an entire forest bare. Can you just imagine that for a second? Just a wind sweeping through a forest with such strength that it rips every last bit of foliage and leaves off of that entire forest. So the question that came to my heart this week was, if the voice of the Lord can strip a forest bare, what do you think it can do to a human heart? God's voice is the most powerful force in existence. And that's why one word, one simple, encouraging, prophetic word from your mouth to somebody around you this week, somebody in your family, somebody that you meet at lunch, one word bursting with encouragement, birthed from the Spirit of God can change the course of someone's life. I have seen this happen. It doesn't have to be fancy. My sister-in-law one time, she was at Taco Bueno. I don't agree with the choice, but you got to love your family. Okay. She was at Taco Bueno and she began to talk to the girl at the register. And again, like I shared earlier, she didn't have a fancy word. I don't even remember what the word was. It was just something God knows you, he loves you. It was just a really simple, encouraging word that the Holy Spirit had her give. And my sister-in-law goes out to the parking lot and the girl at the register that she had prophesied to takes off her headset. She's supposed to be working. She sprints out to the parking lot. She's sobbing and in tears. She comes up to my sister-in-law. She says, I was going to go home after work and take my life. I just, I didn't have anything left. And that word, that word has given me hope to keep going. And and that might seem a little bit intense or whatever, but I'm just telling you, You might not ever hear the stories. You might not ever hear the testimonies. People might not ever tell you, but that one word that you chose to be obedient and give could have had the same effect on somebody, could have lifted them up when they felt doubt, could have comforted them in a time of sorrow, could have given them the hope and the inspiration necessary to keep pushing forward towards what God has for them. I'm telling you, this is the most amazing gift. My heart is that each and every one of us, there's a point There's a reason why we ended with this, because this is the culmination of everything the Spirit does, is speaking through His people to transform the lives of people around us. Why don't you stand? Even tonight, I'm telling you, if if you made other plans tonight, it's okay, cancel them. (laughs) I'm telling you, you you need to show up tonight because we're gonna have some people up here and they're just gonna walk around and they're just hearing words from God. I talked with my dad a few days ago and he's just got an iPad full of stuff. He already feels like God wants to say to people. And, um, yeah, it's amazing. So, so one of the first things you could do if you wanna see prophecy in action, you wanna see the prophetic just demonstrated, you can come tonight. But I just wanna pray for us and I just wanna ask that God would unlock something in you this morning, unlock something in me that we would be a prophetic people, that we would be a prophetic church not so we can look cool or build our our brand, but just so that people around us could be radically encouraged by the voice of God, right? So why don't you just lift your hands all over the room? I'm just gonna pray this blessing. Father, I, I thank you that in your word, it says, in the last days, you will pour out your spirit on all of your people and your sons and your daughters will prophesy and your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both male and female, I will pour out my spirit in those days, says the Lord. So I just declare a blessing over you 
that prophesying is gonna be so easy, it's gonna be such a normal, easy part of your life, that if you are one of his sheep, you hear his voice. Whatever the blockages are, whatever, whatever the enemy has put in your way, I just come against it right now and I say, God, we want to be a people that hears your voice. Would you help us? Would you speak to us this week? I heard, I heard a word in the first service and I, I wanna share it again. You can put your hands down for a second. I, I wanna share this word. I was looking in my backpack this week. I've had this backpack for years. I know it inside and out, right? This backpack I carry every day. And for some reason, as I was searching in the backpack, I hit this pocket and, and I just undid the Velcro. I just, I just said, I, I just need to search. In, I don't know why, I'm just gonna search in this pocket. I reached down in, in uh, that pocket and I pulled out $200 in cash. Some of you think this is going a different direction. You're like, you're like already getting ready to receive. You're like, praise God. No, no. But as I reached in and as I saw that money, I, I just heard the Lord clear as day. It doesn't happen to me every day, but, but I just heard the Lord. He said, it's time to check again. And I just feel like the Lord, I, I just want to do a little demonstration. This is just a prophetic word the Lord gave me for this, but just, I feel like the Lord is speaking that for some people in this room. It's time to check again. You, you tried a, a business idea, it didn't work. It's time to check again. You, you, you looked at your marriage and you saw one outcome, you saw one situation, the Lord says it's time to check again. What, you, you've looked under that rock, you've searched, you, you, you've gone there before, you say, no, no, I, I've gone there, it's dead, I've gone there, it's done, I've gone there, there's nothing left. The Lord says it's time to check again. It's time to check again. So Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, you're so good. We receive all that you have. God, I just pray that you would blow us up tonight at Presbytery. God, that you would just come you're so faithful. You love this church far more than any of us. So we thank you. We love you in Jesus' name, amen.